Yeah. 
correct if the transaction occurs entirely in isolation. Um, now, there's a couple of variations of this that we discussed. Uh, possibility of uh, some ordering occurring over those transactions. But this is, this is one way to think of uh, schedules being correct. And it's one that's used pretty frequently in the, the database community. Um, right. Then we moved on to this notion of, um, we moved on to this uh, specific notion of equivalence uh, called conflict equivalence. Uh, and to recap that, uh, let's say we have two different schedules, and those schedules have the same set of operations. In this case, uh, two reads and two writes. Um, the, uh, this idea of a correct schedule, or sorry, an equivalent uh, a conflict equivalent schedule is one in which the uh, is one in which um, each of the operations that act on the same uh, value, uh, namely transactions that are in conflict, are uh, that all of those conflicts occur in the same order. So in this case, uh, we have two different conflicts: uh, one between uh, T1 and uh, one between uh, operations on D and one between operations on A. And so the idea here is that because uh, the second of those conflicts, the one on A, uh, is uh, appears in the opposite order uh, between these two schedules, they're not equivalent. Any questions? Then we can say that any schedule that is equivalent to one of these ones that we've defined to be unambiguously correct, a serial schedule, we can say that that schedule is also correct. And because we're using this notion of equivalence called conflict equivalence, we're going to say that any schedule that is conflict equivalent to a serial schedule is conflict serializable. And that's one way of note, uh, that we can use to denote correctness. Again, we start with this premise that serial schedules are always correct, and any schedule with the same set of operations and the same conflict ordering is equivalent. So any schedule that's equivalent to uh, a serial schedule, conflict equivalent, sorry, uh, is also correct. Conflict serial. Any questions? serializable. 
But if you add some more transactions, they kind of mask the external effects. And so that's what uh, kind of led to this idea of view serializability, which is what most database systems today are going to use. Um, and so th this is a really subtle point. So if you have even the slightest doubt in your mind, please raise your hand, uh, because it's the, the distinctions here are kind of very easy to miss. So let's say we have a single transaction. What kind of, how, do, how does that transaction interact with the rest of the world? What can that transaction do? We, we treat it as kind of a black box, but that black box can read. Okay, so it can read from the database, and it can write from the database, write back to the database. Uh, it has some old state that it reads in, and it writes out some new state. Great. Uh, are there any kind of other interactions that it might have? Delete. Okay, uh, it, has, it might delete some, uh, some data, but you can kind of think of that as uh, part of this, um, this state transformation. So it, has, it, it reads the, the chunk of data that it's deleting from, and then it writes back a new chunk without, without that data missing. Uh, more to the point, it does, does this transaction interact with anything outside of the database? The user. Okay, so the transaction might interact with the user. More generally, the transaction might uh, connect to uh, any number of sources. It's a bank account. The bank is performing some kind of uh, transfer, let's say. So we have a transaction where someone's doing a money transfer from one bank to another. Um, transaction might uh, decrease the amount of money in my account, but then it had better also increase the money somewhere outside. So there's this notion of what's inside the database, and there's this notion of what's outside the database. And uh, something that's really important to note is that the transactions are not only interacting with the database itself, but they're interacting with all sorts of stuff outside of the database. And uh, anything that the uh, transaction reads out of the database could potentially end up in the hands of a user or some other component outside of the system. Now, the, where view serializability comes into play is uh, not when you're looking at individual transactions, but actually when you're looking at multiple transactions executed together, uh, and I think of them executed as a batch. So I have three transactions here. And each of them has certain kinds of interactions with one another. I have an old state that I'm reading from. I have uh, transaction one reads from that old state, produces a new state, and that new state gets read by transaction two. That new state, uh, then, or transaction then two then produces a new state, that gets read in by transaction three. And then transaction three actually outputs uh, the, the final state. Now what here, uh, and also there might be some uh, kind of information flow going out of the transaction and to the users or basically things that are outside of the database. Now which of these are important? So let me rephrase that. Which of these uh, do we care about for correctness? Let's do this one at a time. So first off, do we care about the information that goes out to the users? Do you think that's relevant for correctness? Yes. Okay, so that, that at all better be correct. Do we care about what goes out into the new state of the database? Yes. Do we care about that? Do we care about the kind of intermediate state of the database here, if we're considering these, the correctness of this set of three transactions? No. Okay, and that's uh, kind of the important bit here. Um, the operations, what we care about, what we really, really care about is the end result. What gets reflected outside of the database. And what's not quite as important is uh, where, what kind of intermediate states the database goes through. And so we can kind of take this set of transactions and group it together into this big uh, multiple entity transaction. And we can think of equivalence in terms of the effects that we see here. So 
what do we need for this? Or what, what, do we, what do we care about? Well, we care about um, the, the transactions interact with uh, the database state by reading and writing. So we want to make sure that these reads and writes kind of happen in some sort of uh, consistent order. Uh, we can, so which kind of connections do we need to set? Well, first off, if our reads, let me back up a little bit. Um, so let's start off not by trying to define what is correct, but let's try and define this notion of equivalence first. So we can say that two transactions or two uh, sorry, schedules are equivalent if they have, uh, if they're kind of connected, if all of these uh, you can think of these uh, reads and writes as little wires. And uh, if all the wires are hooked up in the same way, then that means it's correct, even if uh, there are certain kinds of uh, outputs that are uh, not correct. So uh, let's, let's say one of the transactions performs a read. Well, if whatever value it reads, we can say that the two transactions are equivalent if the, the, uh, the value that that transaction reads is the same in both instances. So if it reads the original value, that's, uh, that's correct. If it reads something that got written over the course of those however many transactions, that's also uh, correct as long as it reads the value that was written by the same transaction. Any questions on that? So um, similarly, yes. Equivalence 
uh, two transactions, two schedules are equivalent if the read uh, flows, or I guess you could say, are, sorry, sockets are connected to the same write socket, whether that's uh, coming from the input or whether it's coming from a previous transaction. Uh, similarly, the writes, uh, what we care about on the write side um, is not, uh, you can kind of think of the, the final state of the database as also having some read sockets. Now some of those read sockets might be connected to the initial state of the database. And some of them may be connected to prior transactions. But the main point is that this, kind of, this kind of wiring diagram is hooked up in the same way. So if, uh, if a particular write was the last write to a particular object, then that had better be the same in both schedules as well. So what kind of so we're kind of capturing a few things from complex serializability here already. We're capturing this idea of uh, we're capturing this idea of um, the read conflicts being in the same way. Because if the uh, if you read from a transaction, that read had better come before any other write. And uh, if you perform a write, uh, that those uh, that write had better come in the same order. Uh, as any previous reads. The reads and the writes had better come in the same order. And this is kind of ensuring that. What isn't it ensuring? So the answer is no, because or it's not conflict serializable, because we reversed the order of two conflicting operations. Everyone follow? So it's not conflict serializable, but would you justify this entire schedule as being correct in general? schedules produce the same final effect because transaction three comes along 
So the, the, uh, the comments is, what if that particular write operation uh, modifies the data value? Uh, then it wouldn't be correct. And that is a good observation. Uh, the model that we are working with here assumes that a write is a complete overwrite. It uh, replaces whatever the value was that was previously there. Um, and if you wanted to do something like increment, that would be first a read operation and then a subsequent write operation. Um, if that's the case, you wouldn't be able to. Uh, so, it, so, yeah. Um, if we were to do that, uh, have if T1, let's say, were uh, an increment and T2 were also an increment, so let's say we had uh, read, run this on the board. So we have two schedules. Um, so we've got read, A, write, A. So you can think of this as an increment. Read, A, write, A, uh, and then write, A. So let's connect our wires here. We've got one wire connected here. We've got uh, one wire um, connected here, and we've got one wire connected here. So A becomes uh, the final value of A comes from here. And so in this case, would it be permissible for me to do something like one, two, three, two is greater than the best one, R A, uh, Exactly. 
hides the fact that there, that, uh, there is a conflict violation. So if we only had transaction T1 and T2, would this be uh, use serializable? Why would you say that? Uh, why do you say that? So the, the wiring, uh, let's actually bring it up over here. Uh, so your, your claim is that even if I get rid of transaction three, uh, the result is still use serializable. Um, so, if I get rid of transaction three, I'm getting rid of, I'm still getting rid of one of these conceptual wires. So, the outgoing state, the, uh, you guys can't see that, can you? Uh, I already have a handy dandy diagram right here. Is that going to enforce conflict serialized? 
well, it, depend, it depends on which object requires the mark. What do you mean by object? serializability is conflict serializability 
unless there is some transaction that obscures or hides uh, a write. So if, if you have transaction three that performs a write, then whatever writes happen to A beforehand, uh, as long as those writes don't get read or aren't in any other way visible, then uh, it's view serializable. It's view serializable. All right. Um, so let's get into a little bit of uh, conservative concurrency control uh, that I kind of glossed over last uh, Monday. And it, uh, didn't do that as much. Uh, now there's this observation that, that there's a lot of uh, overlapping objects in a database. Uh, the entire database we can think of as one object, and there are sort of smaller chunks of the database that you might want to lock, uh, you kind of partition the database in. The, the entire database, tables, and a table consists of a set of columns, it consists of a set of rows, and what we'd like to be able to do is uh, come up with situations where, uh, in general, when we're locking, what do we want to lock? What's the rule of thumb for uh, the locking things? The smallest possible object, exactly. So the, the smaller the object that we can lock, uh, the better. Uh, but at the same time, we have this other problem that some operations might want to lock really big things, and some operations might want to lock uh, smaller things. So we could have the, the, small, uh, the small operations lock the big thing. What, what does that cost us? What kind of problems would uh, uh, what kind of problems would we run into if uh, an operation that wants to modify a row uh, has to lock the entire table. So we get, we get less parallels. Uh, two operations that want to modify individual rows have to, uh, two individual operations that want to lock individual rows uh, can't proceed at the same time, if those rows, even if those rows are different. Uh, but what if we set the locking level to be uh, individual rows. What kind of problem do we, do we run into at, at that point? So what if we, we have a operation that uh, modifies an individual row, and that operation happens at the same time as an operation that modifies the entire table. Let's say we furthermore that we have a lock on the table, and also that we have a lock on the individual rows, or locks for each individual row. A little operation requires a lock on the row. What is the big table operation going to do? OK, so it better wait for that small uh, operation to finish, or else you're going to run into trouble. But how does it know that it needs to wait for that small operation to finish? OK, uh, so we could use some sort of crazy hierarchical locking scheme. Um, what if we didn't have a crazy hierarchical locking scheme? Yeah, so if we didn't have any sort uh, in, uh, in the worst case, uh, acquiring a lock on the table would require checking each individual lock on every single row to make sure that it was safe. And that's, uh, that's not very efficient, especially if you've got millions and millions of rows. So, uh, no, uh, what we really want is some sort of crazy hierarchical locking scheme where we can uh, signify uh, to entities out, uh, outside that if you're about to lock a, um, one of these big objects, uh, you want to be able to communicate to that entity that uh, something already has a lock on one of the smaller objects contained within it. And the way we do this, uh, one uh, strategy for doing this is to use something called intent 
this is a more general uh, locking scheme that we kind of very briefly covered uh, a week ago. Uh, that where you signify that you have a lock on a nested object by using what's, uh, by putting the lock or acquiring uh, the lock in what's called an intent mode. So just like you have a shared lock and an exclusive shared mode of acquiring the lock that allows multiple uh, threads to acquire the, the lock and shared mode, uh, and an exclusive lock. This kind of adds another layer to that. Um, writing intent to share and an intent to lock. Um, so if I wanted to lock a row, I would first require an intent lock on the table. Uh, there's a there's a similar grid. Uh, so just as before, where we had uh, just shared and just exclusive locks, uh, shared can uh, coexist with other shared locks, uh, but not with exclusive locks. And exclusive locks certainly can't coexist with one another. We can come up with a, a bigger 16-entry uh, grid uh, for all four of these. Um, and the way that you use these, you first acquire the outermost a lock on the outermost object, and you progressively work your way uh, in, uh, acquiring intent locks until you acquire a lock on the object that you're looking for. So uh, that's kind of what we covered last time. I had a couple of examples uh, that I wanted to see here still today. Um, so let's say we have two transactions, and one of those transactions has a shared lock on a table. And transaction two wants to come along and acquire an exclusive lock on a row of the table. So what's going to happen? What does transaction two need to do first? It should acquire a, uh, so it's looking to acquire an exclusive lock on a row. So what would it do? IX. So it, it would acquire a intent to exclude lock on the table. Would that work? So we've got uh, an exclusive, uh, sorry, shared lock held on the table, and we'd like to find exclusive, uh, acquire an intent to exclude lock. That's going to fit. So until that shared lock is released, the intent to exclude lock can't proceed, and that individual uh, transaction two will block. Questions on this? Great. I guess I can ask you. Uh, I'm going to keep doing. Uh, okay, let's say transaction one holds an exclusive lock on the table, and transaction two wants to come along and uh, hold a shared, uh, acquire a shared lock on a row. What's going to happen here? What does transaction two need to do? Intent to share, yes. Um, so transaction two, uh, transaction one holds exclusive. Um, and then intent to share blocks. There you go. Transaction one holds a shared. Yeah. Transaction one holds a shared lock on a row of the table. Uh, transaction two wants a shared lock on the entire table. What's going to happen? Transaction two does what? Requires shared block. And what, it, what kind of block is already on the table? Intent to share. Great. So intent to share and share the transaction can proceed safely. 
exclusive lock. Is this okay? No. Okay. Uh, excuse me, why is that? What is uh, transaction one hold on the table? IX. And that's not compatible with exclusive. Um, actually, let's do one more. Uh, generalize this slightly. What if transaction two wants to acquire an exclusive lock on a row of the table? So what does uh, what does transaction two do then? It'll get why? Yep. So it will acquire an IX lock on the table, which is compatible with IX. Uh, and then, if it happens to be the case that they're trying to lock the same row, they'll conflict at the row level. Alright, great. So, that's the main thing I wanted to cover here. So let's get back to uh, optimistic. Let's move on to optimistic. Uh, before I do that, are there any questions on this crazy lock hierarchy for locking? Things are going to go wrong, and you try and be as 
nothing is going to go wrong. Uh, that everything is, uh, is sunshine and happiness, uh, and that the uh, transactions are going to execute in whatever order you feel, uh, whatever order they feel. Um, but then, after the transactions execute, you you see what they did and verify that the uh, that this assumption is correct. So you let the transactions execute whatever order they like, but then at the very end, you make sure that what they ended up actually doing is consistent with what you would call correct. Um, and kind of the key to this is that you have to make sh uh, be able to keep the effects of a given transaction invisible to the rest of the system until that transaction actually commits. Uh, once that happens, you can kind of uh, integrate those in invisible uh, results. Uh, and even if you have to undo that transaction, because all of these results are invisible, there's no uh, threat of interactions. So optimistic concurrency control typically operates in three, uh, a transaction will typically operate in three separate phases. Uh, uh, transaction is going to start with what's called the read phase, uh, which is where the bulk of the work that the transaction does gets performed. Um, the transaction is going to execute from start to end, effectively working with a private copy of the database. There's uh, the second phase is called validate, and this is where the database itself comes into the picture and verifies whether the, the transaction's activity actually has created any sort of conflicts. And if there are conflicts, the transaction gets boarded in this case. And then finally, uh, there's a write phase where all of those operations actually become public. Now, you're conceptually, uh, the, the read phase is the only one that's actually part of the transaction. But why, why would you why would you say that the other two stages right there? Why, why do we have to explicitly consider them as part of the? Uh, why would we even care if they uh, are, are separate? Ones? Well, it's that they're part of the transaction. modifies 10 gigabytes of data. How long is it going to take us to actually put those 10 gigabytes of data or link them into the, the active database? It's going to be a while, right? It's going to take us, well, it depends on the speed of your disk, the speed of a bunch of stuff. But it's going to take us a little bit of time to actually take the effects of that transaction and incorporate them into the rest of the What about validation? Is that, uh, that going to take us some time? Yeah, so basically the, uh, each of these stages, even though the, the read phase is the only one where uh, that's actually part of the transaction itself, each of these phases is a component that takes time. And because it takes time, there's not really any meaningful uh, reason. Uh, because it takes time, we can't just treat it as a critical section. Uh, if the validate and write phase could be done in, in a couple of nanoseconds, we wouldn't even care. We'd just say this is some post processing that we need to do. But integrating results back into the database, uh, doing this validation, this takes time. And because it takes time, we need to apply whatever kind of locking schemes we're, we're going to apply uh, to all of the phases. So, okay, uh, how do these phases actually look? Um, three phase, obviously, purely transaction. This is whatever the transaction, whatever active activities the transaction 
the validation step, we need some way of uh, asserting to ourselves that that transaction, all the, the operations that that transaction performed, are going to be uh, serializable. Uh, so we need some information about the transactions. What do we need? Uh, we need to know what the transaction has performed, what activities the transaction has performed. We need to know what it's written, and we need to know what it's read. We call, typically call these uh, the read set and the write set. Also, as a bit of a convention, we're going to give each of the transactions some sort of identity, uh, timestamp. Um, and this identifier is a way of uh, not just referring to the transaction, but actually sequencing it. Um, now here's, here's a bit of a, a, a question. Why, uh, why would we want to have a set of transactions that we can in a, a specific way. Why would we want to be able to order the transactions? So 
assuming that we're executing the transactions in this order, uh, where we read, do, some, do a bunch of stuff, and write, would it make sense to do the uh, assignment at the very start, or at the very end? Thank you. 